Hello, everybody, and welcome to week four. This week, the Vikings are traveling to the Bears, where they don't traditionally have much success. Before we start, I should mention that uh, I started a new job this last week, and in the chaos, totally forgot to book my guests for the week, and also forgot to go beer shopping. So I have one special beer left that I was saving for today's interview, but I forgot to let that guest know, and you know who you are. So I have a special, special guest today, but I'm hoping to get the guest that was supposed to be on this week on next week. So it's week four, and there's been the stat going around that um, up until Thursday night, at least, the NFC North was 7-0-1 against the rest of the league. They were 9-2-1 like nine, and one or something like that because the Packers beat the Bears and the Vikings. Obviously, the NFC North is a tough division, and also, I think in a lot of ways, kind of fluky. There are very strong defenses, but if you look at the, the records for the teams, the Bears narrowly lost the Week 1 game against the Packers and beat the Broncos, but it wasn't pretty. And, and of course, they whooped up on the Redskins pretty resoundingly, but that was kind of expected. Looking at the strength of schedule, looking at the outcome of the games, the Bears could very easily be 1-2 and two or 0-3. Oh I mean, the Broncos are kind of soft. Meanwhile, the Packers beat the Bears narrowly, again riding their defense. They beat the Vikings, but I can't imagine for Packers fans it was a very comforting victory considering how close the Vikings kept it there at the end. The Vikings are 2-1 and one after crushing the Falcons, getting handled pretty neatly by the, by the Packers, and then absolutely crushing the Raiders. Again, strength of schedule would make it seem like two of those victories were fairly obvious, although the Falcons I thought were going to be a really strong team this year. What is interesting is that the Vikings have basically dominated 11 of the 12 quarters of football they've played, the one bad quarter being the first quarter in Green Bay. What everyone's talking about with the Vikings offense is the fact that Kirk Cousins just can't seem to come up in big moments. And playing a division rival, you know, the defending NFC North champion and possibly like the biggest test in the NFC North, playing them at Soldier Field is a pretty big spot to show up in. Now, their offense is working pretty well because of the running game. And I heard this stat, and I'm sorry, I'm sure I've gone off about it several times in this video series, but people like to say that when you run the ball, you win. And I heard uh, Eric Nordquist on KFAN mention that whenever the Vikings run the ball 28 times or more in Mike Zimmer's tenure here, they win. There is a definite logical fallacy there. Teams run the ball more when they win, not the other way around. What do teams do? when they're down by a touchdown or they're down by a field goal even and there's two minutes left on the clock in the fourth quarter and they have to get points. Do they hand the ball off 28 times? They pass it. Passing moves the ball faster. You have a higher expected value almost in any situation except for you know fourth and short or goal line situations. There you want to run. As the Packers discovered against the Eagles on Thursday. Run it when you're on the goal line. Pass it the rest of the time. Again, again. I understand the need for a balanced attack, and if you can move the ball on the ground, go for it. But if the Bears are shutting it down, I really hope the Vikings offense doesn't like insist on slamming their head against that wall the whole time. The fact that Dalvin Cook, who is very talented, and Alexander Madison and Mike Boone all had good games tells me that the offensive line is actually working the scheme the way it's supposed to work, which means they might have success against that very, very stout Bears defense. If you watched them play the Redskins last week, you know how terrifying they can be. And I honestly see a lot of similarities between Case Keenum and Kirk Cousins and their offensive lines. And Cousins fumbles the ball a ton. Keenum had it knocked out of his hands three times. That's scary. That's that's my like my big A topic. Like if Cousins can hold on to the ball and not throw interceptions or get the ball stripped from his hands, we'll be in pretty good shape. I want that in like sparkling lights. Don't turn it over. Meanwhile, the Bears' offense is kind of the bland, inefficient blob that we've seen the last couple of years. Allen Robinson, I've been his hottest target, and I believe he's the player we're going to have to really clamp down. I'm not terribly worried about the running game. The Vikings have been susceptible to the run, but what scares me more is Mitchell Trubisky's rushing ability because we always get daggered by mobile quarterbacks and trick plays. So... We'll have to be looking out for Cordero Patterson, end arounds, that kind of stuff. All in all, I'm optimistic about the game if we can keep Cousins clean. If we can't, I don't see a way to win the game because it's, it's that bad. 
Uh, the Bears defense is very stout. Enough of me talking. It's time for some very special beer and a unusual guest. I'll be right back. All right. Welcome back, everybody. And again, because of my airheadedness, um, my special guest this week is none other than Game Day Jake. Jake, thank you for being here. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Now, the beer I'm drinking this week is from the Hammerheart Brewery in Lionel Lakes, Minnesota. Uh, it was I was introduced to it by the guest that was supposed to be here this week. No offense. I'm taken. Just glad I could help fill in. And I really wanted I really wanted to save it for then, but I don't have any other beers to sample for you guys this week. Uh, Hammerheart Brewing is a really interesting place. It's over in Lionel Lakes. Again, the front, I was in Norway and Iceland last year, may have mentioned it a time or two on this very show. He has. And the front of it looked so similar to a lot of stuff that we saw um, in the, like the folk museum even. And you go inside, it's a very unique place. Lots of very like rough crafted wooden tables, uh, shields on the wall. They play nothing but like Northern European metal music. Not real loud, so it's not like it's going to give you a headache, but it's definitely an ambiance that it creates. And this week I am drinking the uh, Von Winterhurst Verhast uh, Hefeweizen. It's a smoked Hefeweizen. Uh, Hefeweizens, I believe, uh, it's a type of wheat beer. And um, something about the yeast makes it kind of cloudy, like maybe like a spotted cow. And I, um, I tried a few of their beers there. Very unique stuff. They've got barley wine, very heavy, rich, get-you-through-the-winter kind of beers. I did not have this one, so I'm very excited. I've been sitting on it for about a month or uh, two months now, probably. I am very excited. Are you ready? I am so ready. Crack it open. All right, let's crack it open. This is a very, very nice color. Very rich orange almost. Uh, maybe amber is the proper beer term. Amber is the proper beer term, yes. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's correct. That looks really good. It smells like bananas, which I think, which I think is actually common for Hefeweizens. Banana and citrus, maybe. You ready? Skull. Skull. Hmm. That's that's excellent, right? That is, that is a, such a robust flavor to it and really a, a, really a well-rounded mouthfeel. I believe that's a term that people use. Uh, you might know more than me. You've been doing this series longer than I have. Um, but like some beers kind of really, really light, really acidic, almost astringent. Some of them are very heavy and smooth, like a, like a stout. This is somewhere in between where you kind of feel it on your tongue, but it, it, it kind of melts away. I really like that. That's very good. Yeah, very rich, very, very flavorful. The smokiness is is there, but it's not oppressive. It's, mm, this is excellent. Excellent indeed, sir. Again, so good. So, and a, a strong finish and not really too much of an aftertaste. It's not a bad aftertaste. There's a little bit of that banana that sticks around. I, that's pretty good. Yeah. Oh, that is excellent. Nice work. Again, it's Hammer Harp. Very unique place. Uh, if you like beer, if you like, uh, like kind of Nordic and Celtic culture, I like both of those things. It's an interesting place. Uh, I, I believe if I'm getting the story right, the, the guy who runs that brewery spent some time in Norway, met a brewer there. Maybe it was Scotland. I don't remember. Met a brewer over there, fell in love with it, and decided to come back and make it all right here in America. And if you want to go, I could probably be talked into going because I'm going to need more of this. All right. Now, game day, Jake. Yes, sir. You have your highs and your lows, right? You, you, as most Vikings fans do, you find yourself trying not to get invested in the game, but, and, but you end up getting invested in the game, right? Yeah, I would say that's accurate. Uh, every week I tell myself, you know, hey, 
there's a good chance they lose this game. And so what? It's just a football game. There are so few opportunities in life to really put your weight behind something and get excited about something and, and cheer for something. And I find that football is the one thing that I can still really just just be a fan of it. And so I, you know, I put on the purple, I get fired up, uh, I, I think of all the ways that we can win the game and about how awesome it would be if we just came out and, and just shellacked the opponents. Um, but then there's that part of me that's like, oh, you know, the, the team this week is really tough and this matchup could go wrong. And there was the Buffalo Bills game in week three of last year that went totally off the tracks despite it being a, a loser-proof game. And uh, so I, I, I ride that roller coaster every week and when they win, I'm usually pretty happy. Uh unless it was like not a convincing win or, you know, in the case of like the Raiders where it's like, yeah, I kind of expect you to beat the Raiders. Uh, and when they lose, if it's, if it's like, because the other team just looked so good, I usually handle it. Okay. But if it's because the Vikings just got embarrassed or looked bad, that's a lot tougher for me. Right. So you are traditionally a very guarded individual in terms of your hopes for the season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sorry, was that, was that, yes, yes, I am. Okay. So, because you're just trying to, you know, you're just kind of hoping that it's, that it's good until it's not, right? That's a good way of looking at it. That it's not a long, last year was rough, because last year was a long, drawn out, kind of ongoing, painful experience, because they made you believe, and they looked okay this week, and bad that week. What are your thoughts on this season? Again, I, I mean, as much as I want to be on board and as much as I want it to go very well, I, I guess I'm just always waiting for the other shoe to drop. If the Vikings were 3-0 and now and had escaped from Lambeau with a victory, I'd be feeling pretty good because, again, 11 of 12 quarters, they've dominated, right? So I would be feeling pretty good about that, but at the same time, I'd be very nervous about an injury or um, you know, Cousins turning back into a pumpkin, something like that, you know? So, so my thought is like we have all the tools to be a Super Bowl team, you know, a strong defense, a strong running game, uh, many options in the passing attack, including Irv Smith now, a rookie tight end who traditionally they don't do much, and maybe that was just a one game situation, but it would be nice to see him getting more involved, especially with, right, with them being thin at wide receiver. Can you make the case for them going to the Super Bowl this year? Oh, can I make the case? them going to the Super Bowl this year. I can try. Um, okay, so let's just suppose Kirk Cousins figures it out. Uh, we've got a team of offensive-minded geniuses now. Gary Kubiak, Rick Dennison, Kevin Stefanski, they're all teaming up. And honestly, the success of the running game this year, no matter who is in the backfield, tells me that they've schemed that up very well. I am concerned because they're constantly running the bootleg, which is something they have to do, but teams are going to scheme for that eventually. They're going to figure it out, and the Bears have the defensive talent to shut that down. Oh, man, the case for the Super Bowl. If they can scheme ways for Cousins to find high-efficiency op passing opportunities and move the ball on the field and keep the defense from just loading the box every time, I think that's the path to victory. We're going to need turnovers from the defense. We're going to need more big games from Dalvin Cook. We're going to need him to stay healthy or at least hope that all of the improvements to the offensive line and the scheme in general will mean that we can plug and play most other backup running backs in that backfield and, and have success. I, again, I just I feel like we don't have the big-time quarterback that we need to win in big moments, and most of the playoffs are going to have big moments and big games. All fair points, right? Even in this staged setup, you cannot force yourself to be a homer. You cannot force yourself to to come out of your shell and, and give the people something. Give the people something. I what what do you want me to say? The the they, they have a they have a backup level quarterback in if you want me to like double down right here and now and say, hey, they're on their way to the Super Bowl because look at our roster, I can't do that. Because of the quarterback. You give us Patrick Mahomes, Deshaun Watson, even Phillip Rivers. And I think we, I would, I would be able to make a case for you and you, right now, that this is a Super Bowl caliber team. 
But I just feel like, you know, we might we might be able to ride our way to like a, a ten and six season on the backs of strong, hard nosed nineteen twenties Bronco Nagurski level football. But I just think we're gonna flop in the big moment, as the Vikings do. And and ironically, I mean we've got a we've got a reputation for flopping in big moments, and we signed a quarterback who is notorious for coming up short against winning teams and against teams when it matters. We're doubling down on choking away victories. Okay, all right. I, I mean, I, I understand, obviously. <laughs> I, I, I feel like we're on the same page. We are, and I'm sorry for shouting. I just, I get carried away. Now, with the rumor going around that Stefan Diggs uh, is requesting a trade, and then we lost Chad Beebe, they brought back Laquan Treadwell. Oh, Laquan Treadwell. We're saved. And now... Our, our passing game, which already looked kind of dismal, is going to look real bleak if we lose Stefan Diggs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if we lose Stefan Diggs, I mean, they're going to be able to sell out against Adam Thielen. We're going to have nobody behind Thielen, really. I mean, Laquan Treadwell, we cut him. We cut him, and he's so bad, no one else wanted to pay him. That's why he was still out there waiting to be picked up. We've got, you know, Irv Smith and Kyle Rudolph, but really, our passing game, on the one hand, it doesn't really matter because we're not passing the ball anyway. We're running it. But... If you trade away Stefan Diggs like he says he wants, allegedly, allegedly, this is all rumors. He hasn't got up on the podium and said anything about it. Who knows? But if you do that, you are taking away the passing option entirely. You're just punting that position. Thielen is great, but they're going to be able to sell it to stop him. You got to keep Diggs happy. You got to pass him the ball. Hopefully that means he has a big week, which he might because the Bears have a problem with perimeter wide receivers and Stefan Diggs is one of the best. Right. He's a deep threat. People, I mean, even, I want to say, like, in his second year, were comparing him to Antonio Brown. Positively. Right, not the, uh, in the tabloids, Antonio Brown. Positively. Not not this Antonio Brown, but Antonio Brown at the time, who was burning up the league, fantastic at running crisp, clear routes. Stefan Diggs has that ability, but he's in an offense where the quarterback can't deliver him the ball. Despite a, a significantly improved offensive line, at least with the running game. I, there, I do think there are some weaknesses with the passing protection, but the running game is there. They are... They're going to lose Stefan Diggs because he's got skill and they're not using him, which, again, I've mentioned on this show in past weeks is a problem. Why are you paying two stud wide receivers and paying a, an exorbitant amount of money to a quarterback just to have him hand the ball off? That's a good point you make. But, but enough about that. The other person who came back this week, Laquan Treadwell was one, and and special teams all-star, Marcus Sherrills, who's been with the team forever, was with the Saints this year, had an injury, got cut, and he's back. He's the punt returner, probably to replace Chad Beebe, who had been returning punts. But he's also a great special teamer all around, and uh, also a kind of a third-string defensive back. What are your thoughts on that? You know, we are getting back several of our defensive backs. Uh, Mackenzie Alexander, hopefully. Mike Hughes, hopefully, is getting better. Uh, he came back last week, of course. It's nice to have that security on the special teams that we're not going to be muffing punts. Marcus Sherrills is rock solid. He's not He's not Devin Hester. He's not Cordero Patterson. He really hasn't had that ceiling, but his floor is very high. He gets you a, lo- he gets you a hearty amount of yards on the punt returns. He doesn't fumble the ball. He's got ball security. He's also, and I believe I've heard... Uh, Paul Allen talk about his skills as a gunner. I'm not a special teams analyst, but I, I believe him. Uh, he watches more football than I do. Uh, so it's good to have him back. All right. Now, Game Day Jake, uh, I mentioned in, in the first segment of the show that I am most concerned about the Vikings keeping Cousins safe because he is very susceptible to pressure in the pocket. I think the offensive line has flaws. And what the team has done so far is to roll him out on bootlegs which I I mentioned last year would have been a good idea to keep him from getting trapped and and sacked and stripped of the ball. The Packers cracked that code. They did. They did, yeah. And uh, I think it showed pretty obviously. They had a lot of success with it against the Falcons. I mean, on all 10 passes that they completed. And then, really, the pass did not look good for most of the game against the Packers because they always seemed to have a linebacker coming around the end unguarded because they were trying to sell the the naked bootleg then surprisingly the Raiders didn't follow that mold but now the Bears have had two weeks they've got a lot of defensive talent and I think they're going to find a way to repeat the Packers success against that so I I guess I'm trying to figure out you know the chess game they have to play now are they going to have to just go away from the bootleg in the first quarter entirely 
make it look like they're they've changed their game plan, their style. I mean, they're going to do some reverses, you know, bootleg them out, hand it off, and have it come. I don't know. They're going to have to disguise it somehow, or totally change the way they scheme. Because I have to imagine Khalil Mack is going to be just a nightmare. He's going to be the one you know, tracking Cousins. Uh, he he's a defensive end, linebacker, kind of everything because he's a freak. He's going to have a very I think easy time corralling a very barely ambulatory Kirk Cousins. Right. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a real problem if they if they're able to get contain on him or even you know just have someone spy him. He's not going to take off and run it around the linebacker. He seems to, like, once he sees that person with no one between him and, and the defender coming, he seems to lock down and, and clam up. And if that person's Khalil Mack, he's going to lock down. All right. Thank you for joining me. I know you had uh, something else you were supposed to be doing today, but uh, I'm glad you made time to come in. Happy to be here. I'm glad I can make it. Can I just say, in addition to your salient points and an impeccable attire, oh, this, I, I just had it laying around, that you have fantastic hair, sir. Oh, Oh, thank you. Uh, well, honestly, my wife makes me cut it this way. Uh, I would either like to go back to buzzing it all off entirely or having it back down to, you know, shoulder length. But, you know, the things we do for love. And and if I may say so, uh, you also have fantastic hair. Uh, I really like what you're doing with it. Uh, you know, the, the sun-dappled highlights. I mean, I don't know if the camera's picking those up, but the sun-dappled highlights on this guy. Well done. Thank you. I means a lot coming from you. All right. Well, everybody, this has been Game Day Jake. Thank you so much for coming in today. Hey, again, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. I hope I never have to interview you again. No offense. Hey, none taken. You know, uh, two positives on a magnet, two negatives on a magnet. You know what I'm going. You know where I'm going with this, right? It's just too much of too much of this energy in the same room is is not good for for us or really for the camera. And also, if I'm here again, it means you the dog pretty royally so all right take care and enjoy the game today hey thanks uh i'll try thank you everybody for watching and uh as always <laughs> bears i think what he meant to say but he was flustered is uh skull feel the and <laughs> the bears thanks for watching guys